I wanted to make sure that uh, we had all met so that uh, you uh, can interrupt any time. Okay, this will keep this very informal. Uh, and I have, uh, there's a presentation now and then later on there'll be a workshop. So let's, uh, let's get going. This is, a, this is a, a company of mine in, uh, in Copenhagen called Silent Green. And this is our uh, topic today, the uh, circular, e circular economy. Has anybody heard or do, do you know what the circular economy is? Raise your hands. Anybody know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much related to Cradle to Cradle. Um, uh, but your ministry has uh, gotten behind this uh, circular economy, as has the ministry of, uh, in, in the Netherlands, which is where I just moved from. Uh, it's very interesting, and I think it's going to be a big part of, um, as, uh, how do you say uh, what you're studying? It's constructing, uh, constructing architects actually is really the, the backbone of, uh, of good cradle-to-cradle -cradle architecture in practice. And I can, I'll show you why. Uh, and then how this also relates to Denmark and its clean tech sector, which isn't always related to architecture, but it's becoming much more related to architecture as we, you know, minute by minute. And, and as this as a possible export product as well. So what we're doing in Denmark uh, is, is very applicable overseas. So, uh, and I like the idea of this being a month of architecture that is for and of and by the students. That's pretty creative. So, uh, if you like it, you can congratulate yourself, you know. Uh, but, you know, we had a little news. I'm actually from, uh, from the U.S. and it uh, uh, looks like we were successful in uh, uh, getting a second term for Obama. But there's some things that, um, you guys, you woke up to the news, you, you, heard, you know? Yeah, okay. Um, being an expat, this is very important because there's a lot of things that happen. Have you prepared other presentations with Rami? Sorry? Have you prepared other presentations with Rami? No, I was just, it was, was going to be a slide that I'm del I would have to have deleted. Oh, okay. So it would have been a little silent, you know, silent green on that. You know, so. uh, but he's, uh, he's getting on his uh, running shoes because now he's got a lot of work ahead of him. Uh, and we want to talk about this circular economy and what that is. But Really and truly what uh, preceded it, I think, is very interesting, which is cradle to cradle. But I want to start, I, I spent a few years, uh, I'm American, but I was most recently for last years in, uh, in Holland. But uh, I spent uh, about five, six years in San Francisco in Silicon Valley area. And this, I don't know if you know what Moore's Law is, the observation that over the history of computing hardware, the number of transistors on integrated circuits doubles approximately every two years. What does this all mean? means that they've really gotten it down to every 18 months a computer or some kind of circuitry is obsolete. And, and so it needs to be renewed or it needs to be thrown away. And that is created um, in a related way, this create, make, and toss society. So uh, even though we're starting to try to manage some of these uh, computer screens and, and, and other uh, products in the uh, economy, it's, it's a real mess. And in fact, we, we say that we don't have an energy problem, we have a materials problem. Well, you're in the business of using materials, right? So this is going to be very interesting. So this is that linear economy, make, take, and toss. <coughs> um, but what I want to do is go back to a very simple metaphor. I worked for, uh, for William McDonough, who is the author of Cradle to Cradle. Uh, I was his director in Amsterdam. And, you know, for all of Bill's great ideas and, and shortcomings, and he had plenty of those. Uh, the metaphor of using the tree is, is really amazing. You know, consider uh, this dogwood tree. It produces oxygen, creates habitat, stores carbon, fixes nitrogen, distills water, builds healthy soil, that's important, uses the sun's energy to make food, creates cooling through evaporation, and changes with the seasons. There's one more thing that's really nice self-replicates. Huh? And your buildings need to self-replicate. We'll maybe have some ideas about that. So let's talk about cradle to cradle a little bit. Who wants to take a stab at what cradle to cradle is? Camilla. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. You're probably tired from organizing. Does anybody, has anybody read the book? Give me one sentence on cradle to cradle. Waste equals? Thank you. Okay. But it goes a lot farther than that. Good for participation. Uh, first principle is waste equals food. Everything is a nutrient for something else. 
Okay, simple. There's no concept of waste in nature. It just doesn't exist. It's totally man-made. We've done it, and you're about to embark on a career where you're going to do a lot of it. Well, let's hope not. The next principle is use of current solar income, energy that can be renewed as it is used. And finally, uh, celebrating diversity, species, cultural, innovation, diversity. These are three, they sound really simple and real general and real kind of ivory tower, but uh, you'll see when we get into some of these, in this case study in Holland, how we've uh, applied it. Um, so this is 2009, this is before the word circular economy came into being, but uh, if you look at this wheel, and I, I had trouble, uh, this is from McDonough's office, I, I'm dyslexic, so I, I said, what, is it, what am I reading here? I could not read things upside down, it's just, I could never do it. Uh, but anyways, you start up here with material production. So when you have a, a, a building component, where does it come from? So you, you find out, you evaluate what's the component made of, uh, how you buy it, how it's uh, acquisitioned, uh, the refining of it, and the production. So that's, that's very interesting. And then, then where you guys normally come into play is this building production. So you're planning, you're designing, you're constructing, you're fitting the building out, you're putting the stuff into it. Uh, so we, we know this process pretty well. Yeah? Uh, and then the occupancy part. So I don't know if, if all buildings do this, but there should be user training for every building so they use the building properly and they don't wear it out before it's time. Monitoring to make sure that the building is doing what everybody said it would do. Sometimes promises made, promises broken is more the case in our business. Fine tuning. Buildings have to be flexible. And, uh, and then the key word, enjoyment, you know? I mean, if you build a building that's really energy zero and it's got all the healthy materials, but it's ugly, you know, forget it. That's going to get torn down as well. And then you've, you've done nothing. So aesthetics comes into it. And then we come to material recovery. This is the new stuff, okay? Disassembly training, okay? If I were to give you one thing to take home and do for the rest of your career, Learn how to make buildings for disassembly. You know how we have a uh, jip board that comes together and you tape it and it goes and you glue it and you know all those type of mechanisms, we, they're going to be outlawed within your career because the material is going to be too valuable to be stuck on a wall permanently. Okay? Uh, and everything from the outside, uh, from the enclosure to the things inside of the building, maybe the infrastructure as well. Maybe that comes apart, it's plug in, plug out. On-site disassembly, what does that mean? We'll talk about it. Material separation, yeah, it's one of, the, one of the big problems. Things that are glued and screwed together that can't come apart, like this table. You know, if you, go, if you take a holiday down in Tuscany and you see a, a building there and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, for 300 years no one's been in it. It's just a chimney there and there's moss growing on it and little animals and it's kind of slowly but surely going back to Earth earth, you know, because where did it come from? Right there. You know, they, they made it from the local materials. Well, if we took, uh, you know, your dad's sailboat over here in the fjord and buried it in the ground, you know, 5,000 years, you'd open it up and it's ready to go. It's, it's, it hasn't composed, decomposed at all because it's made of all these technical nutrients that don't decompose. Nor, not only that, you can't even get one layer off the other. So, uh, so maybe we're going to be rethinking about that process. And then uh, material reconditioning. That they talk of a lot about in uh, the circular economy. Okay. Handy though, huh? Now you can read it. I, I worked on that last night. Uh, so this is the book, Cradle to Cradle. It's uh, been written in many different languages and most importantly, your language. Who's Danish here? Any, any Danes? No? <laughs> well, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to be. I'm in my uh, Sprolk school in, uh, in Copenhagen, so I won't even begin. Uh, so the, I got a little clip here I want to show you. William Bradford speaking in 1630 of the founding of the Plymouth Bay Colony, said that all great and honorable actions are accompanied 
with great difficulty. And both must be enterprised and overcome with admirable courage. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. <laughs> A little dramatic music there. You know, it was interesting. I, um, if you think about what they were doing back in the 60s and uh, the big race, the space race, uh, even this is a little before my time, but um, uh, Kennedy was pretty interesting. There's another speech I, wanna, I want you to consider. This is interesting. You see this little uh, yellow bar. <coughs> this is a speech he made in, uh, in 62 goes like this. No man can fully grasp how far and fast we've come, but condense, if you will, the last 50,000 years, 50,000 years of man's recorded history into the time span of but a half a century. So 50, from 50,000 to 50, okay? Just knock the three zeros off. Uh, stated in these terms, we know very little, about, very little about the last 40 years, except at the end of them, advanced man learned to use the skins of anal, animals to cover themselves. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And less than two months ago, during this whole 50-year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton was exploring the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights, telephones, automobiles, airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin, television, and nuclear power, and now if America's spacecraft succeeds in reaching, reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. So that was Kennedy in 1962. If he was alive today, it might go something like this. One hour ago, we discovered the internet. Ten minutes ago, a woman in Mumbai used a mobile telephone who had never even had a landline before. Our micro-investors uh, delivered vital services to rural areas in, uh, in, in, in poor Africa, in Mali. Five minutes ago, Copenhagen decided to go carbon neutral. One minute ago, social media forced these dictators out of power in the Middle East. And one second ago, Barack Obama became, he got his second term. It even gets better. Let's go into the future. 60 seconds from now, you all will be the leaders of a thriving Danish circular economy setting the new design standard in Europe. 70 seconds from now, your car will be the carrier of power from your home to your work, and they'll pay you for that. 80 seconds from now, you'll build, design, maintain, and operate your own dwelling that you can disassemble like a bunch of Lego blocks huh? and return for a new model, creating zero waste. Okay? So this is happening very fast, and uh, Kennedy was brilliant. And what he was saying was just the tip of the iceberg. We see things that are happening that if you talk to your grandparents, they're going, huh? You know, so um, it's, it's truly a, an amazing time. So having said that, Cradle to Cradle, uh, I started my career, um, let's see. Oh, yeah, this is the first picture of uh, when the first astronaut circled around the dark side of the moon and came and saw Earth for the first time. It was actually color, but this is a black and white illegal photograph. Alan Shepard, and, uh, and this was what everybody thinks is the beginning of the Earth First movement. So, is when you get a perspective on your own world. Oh, this is me. Uh, I'm an American. Uh, I come from these different places in the U.S. Uh, oh, hey, that changes the whole show, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C., and then I moved to California. And this is the uh, 89 earthquake. So I learned about lateral forces. You know about lateral forces? They're real. And then I moved to a place called Minnesota. Boy, this is really going too fast. My apologies. Okay, and back a little bit. Yeah, and uh, designed for cold climate. 
Actually, there's a lot of your fellow countrymen that live up in Minnesota. So uh, they seem to like the cold. I don't know. Um, and then uh, uh, Virginia Tech in 1980, this is a solar studio that I was uh, working with with a, with a graduate student that we, uh, we designed and built and got a grant for. But uh, these little things right here, oh, forget that. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a solar envelope uh, module. And this is ground cooling, a very crude form of ground cooling, and it made all kinds of problems inside the walls. Little things grew in there. But it's the first of its kind. And then uh, you look 30 years later, it's the first time we did it at, at Virginia Tech, and uh, now they're winning the solar decathlon. Uh, have, does any of your universities to, uh, participate in the solar decathlon? We're planning on You should. Yeah. It's so great. I know that you're doing th something here with the containers, and uh, where you're trucking uh, um, prefabricated uh, parts to China. This, is a, this whole thing has to be you know, transported on a, on a flatbed truck and in a container as well, and then brought into its reality, uh, into its real state. And, uh, and then, of course, for the last eight years, I've been in Holland, which uh, we battle the water. And of course, this is Copenhagen. Uh, and I was with some companies that were very interesting. And this is a company that was made comprised of half design architects and half building constructing uh, uh, specialists. But uh, the guys who were the technical guys, uh, we were commissioned to build a building off-site and float it down the Moss River. And this was just a tremendous project and no one even thought of it as a green project. But uh, I came to them and said, hey, you know, guys, you don't know how much embedded energy was, was, was saved by building it in one place and floating it downstream and then hoisting it onto its site. Not the prettiest building in the world, but it was a, a spectacular event. You can count the, I don't know, uh, nine stories tall. And uh, I can assure you all of Holland was, you know, sitting on the sidelines watching this thing go by. Then we would do buildings that we'd cover old buildings in glass skin for uh, energy efficiency. Uh, and, then, and then we started doing work in China. Uh, this is a sound barrier for Schiphol Airport. It had a lot of uh, innovative techniques. This is a building that actually just has a, its whole skin is an energy generating uh, uh, device and a project in Malaysia. And then finally, uh, when I was with that Dutch company, we contacted uh, Bill McDonough and said, when he was coming to, uh, to Holland, we said, we'd like, to, we'd like to try to help you figure out how to take these ideas and make them real. And he had a few projects and he said, okay, that sounds good. And he, uh, <laughs> He allowed us to be uh, uh, their executive architects for a project that you'll see later on this afternoon. But that's Bill. And uh, I, I, I have to say one of the things I'm most proud of is it's, we do a lot of, we've done a lot of uh, buildings with, um, and developments with the big players, you know, Ford and Google and NASA. This is for NASA here. But the thing that really was impressive was down in Katrina uh, when, uh, when New Orleans was decimated and finding out a way, and this is Brad Pitt, uh, the Make It Right Foundation to, uh, to, number one, help the people get back up on their feet with temporary housing, but then build things properly the second time. Because Katrina was not a natural disaster. It was a man-made disaster, okay, when the levees broke and then they didn't uh, uh, take care of the people. So, so that's on us, you know. If we're the technical guys that are supposed to make sure that we're building things right. Uh, so we said, no, that's it. It's not going to happen again. We're not just going to put something together and just take care of people and get them out of the way. We're going to make it right. So uh, I was really proud of Bill uh, taking that on. Completely free work for about a year. So, uh, so that was neat. Uh, this, is, this is a building for NASA, and it is a building for disassembly. Okay? So they can do it. They also can make energy in the stars and do all things with water when you're out on the space station. So they're... I would say that they're a pretty good client to have, you know. Most guys come to you and they say, you know, can you make my house warmer, you know, and I don't want to pay any energy bills. Okay. So, um, and then in, uh, uh, in Holland, I was with a guy named Thomas Rao, who's very interesting. Uh, these are all, um, uh, I would say Thomas is probably one of the first guys. He's German, but he's been in uh, the Netherlands for 20 years doing energy neutral and even energy positive buildings, and they're real. They, they really are energy neutral or energy positive. And this is the first uh, CO2 neutral building, uh, the WWF. And this is a, this is a bridge that uh, is, has data stored in the bridge and is 
cooled by these windmills and, uh, and then a performing arts center. And most recently, uh, I'm involved with a consortium uh, of Dutch architects and planners and social engineers. And we're working in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., rebuilding some of the really, really bad neighborhoods. And this is my own uh, circular economy. I'm back in Washington, D.C., working with a bringing a bunch of Dutch guys in, working in a neighborhood with 30 years ago was a no-go zone. It's only gotten worse. You know, it's really, and, uh, any of you seen The, um, the Wire? That, uh, uh, it's a show that's on HBO. Um, <laughs> this is The Wire. It's really bad. So we're, uh, we're involved in a project there. But that's, that's, the, that's the third leg of, uh, of sustainability. You know, sustainability has, well, the, one of the first legs of sustainability is economy. You know, does it make sense financially? And the second one is ecology. Is it good for the environment, right? The third one's equity. You know, does it, are the people uh, impacted by your design and your interventions? So circular economy. Now, um, there is something called the McKinsey Report, and it's an uh, interesting report. Uh, it's very long. Uh, it's sponsored by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and I think Ellen MacArthur was um, one of these sailors that sailed around the world. She's a young, young woman in her 30s, and, uh, but the McKinsey Report uh, really has identified um, that the circular economy, the thinking behind the circular, circular economy is a big, big business opportunity. And, uh, and uh, if you check out any of these reports, you'll start to see uh, that it does make sense. And I think your minister, uh, Ada Alkin, is that did I pronounce her name right? Yeah, yeah. She has uh, you know, really gotten behind this uh, report. And it is really kind of cradle, cradle part two, but it, it really steps it up and scales it up to an industry level, uh, energy infrastructure level. And you see these uh, circles. <coughs> We'll go into some of the more basic things about um, uh, cradle cradle, but you know, cradle cradle is based into two things, two nutrient cycles, a biological nutri nutrient cycle and a technical nutrient cycle. Biological means that uh, this thing here, uh, you know, goes in the ground. It not just uh, is biodegradable, it, but it decomposes. Okay, difference. Uh, and there's certain like your wood floor, if it's not treated, uh, will will return to nature. Uh, most of the things that we build buildings with are in this thing we call technical nutrient cycles. So, uh, which is everything else, which is a lot of, um, a lot to consider. We can't, we can't and won't and shouldn't uh, just build buildings that are only made of natural materials because that's not the real world. It's great if you can, yeah. And the more, the more the merrier, but there's, but we are so far into the technical uh, part of it. We need to find a way to um, use these assemblies of materials, of raw materials, in a better way so that we can continue to re re reuse them or put them back into the cycle in another use that doesn't take a lot of energy. Yeah, so they have a couple, uh, so we're going from linear to circular, okay. Uh, we've got to des design out the waste. That's going to be your job today. And uh, the ease of disassembly. So if you look, zoom in a little bit to these circles, uh, these collection devices and um, the different aspects, the, the further out you get, the, the, the more energy it takes and the less uh, effective it is. So the, the, cl the closer in uh, these circles are from the service provider, uh, product manufacturer and parts manufacturer, the more effective it is. So they have these, again, it's, some of this is a little bit abstract, but it'll make sense later on. So it's the power of the inner circle. The smaller inner circle, uh, uh, the less it needs to be changed. The power of circling longer. Uh, uh, so you're maximizing how many times these elements go through the cycle. Okay, so the, the most times win. Uh, the power of cascading use, diversifying a reuse across the value chain, minimizing raw materials in use. You know, this is very interesting. Uh, you know, Kalimborg? You know that city? Am I saying it right? Kalimborg? Yeah. Um, they're one of the first cradle cradle cities and they've been doing it for 30 years. All these uh, major uh, uh, in industries are using one guy's waste becomes a, a raw material for their product that they make. And they've been doing it for a long time and they're just getting better and better at it. And now they're, now they're bringing the smaller, the next tier of um, 
of, uh, of uh, entrepreneur and smaller industries uh, into that, that cycle. So what happens is that you start to get some of these new products that, that come, come through new minds saying, hey, we have this, what can we do with it? Or, uh, you know, this one, we've only been able to get rid of 80% of this, 20% is just annoying. It, it, you know, if you, it sounds complicated, but uh, anybody here have a farming background? Anybody uh, have uh, family that's in the farming business? Don't be afraid of it, it's okay, it's a good thing. Um, you know, what does a farmer do? He, he hates it when he has to ask to bring, someone to bring something in and he has to pay out money. Oh! And then he hates it when you have to pay someone to take something away. Don't they just, they love to use everything right there on site. Let's start thinking like farmers. You know, this is really what it's about. And uh, uh, it sounds like, oh, well, maybe we should just do everything very nationalistic and close the borders and, you know, don't talk to Sweden for Pete's sakes or those Norwegians or... No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, uh, maybe the Copenhagen guys. You know. But... Um, uh, so it is about using local things uh, well. And in a power of pure circles, uncontaminated material streams increase redistribu redistribution and it also maintains its quality. Because when you look at the, 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 the waste sites and you see the things that are in there, it's almost like your own biology is sitting there in this waste pile. And, uh, and so all of that's going to be changing. And it's pretty amazing. I hope that you don't have a career later on as a, one of the scavengers in the landfills, but uh, you never know. Uh, today, let's talk about some applications today. We like to think of buildings as materials banks, you know? And look at this, you know, this is just gorgeous material. Of course, this is not a building for disassembly, you know? And if you tried, I think you'd get in a lot of trouble. They might put you on trial. Uh, so what we're thinking of is we want to consider uh, like a light fixture where we're not buying a lamp, but we're leasing lumens. Okay, so what does that all mean? Let's just say we have this lamp here. Say it's, a, oops, say it's 100 euros. Uh, half of that price is, from, is taking the product from wholesale to retail, you know, the cost of marketing it. Of the remaining 50%, maybe another half of that goes to the raw materials that it took to make it, and then the other half is the labor to actually make the thing. What we're saying is, all I want to do is lease that last 25%, okay? Because at the end of that lease, I give it back to you, the, the manufacturer, and, uh, and you give me a new, a new lamp that's updated. And you say, oh man, wow, this sounds very complicated. Why would I want to do that? Well, first of all, the, the manufacturers of this lamp, they see that they have serious material shortages. It's true. Uh, with the, uh, as China and India and the other BRIC nations are building, 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 we're slowing down here in Northern Europe. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But the, and the mining of raw materials that are that's going on in China right now is a big deal, you guys. Don't think that it isn't. Uh, and, you'll, and you'll see that the amount of increases, you know, through, through the history of uh, being uh, in, the, in the building industry, you'll see prices for materials go up, and then what do we do oftentimes? We, the other part is labor. Sometimes we manipulate the labor to go down so that at the end, you have a net zero effect, so you have materials going up and down, and then labor can go high. That type of thing was the normal way it used to be. Forget it. Materials is doing this. It just keeps on going, 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 going. Okay, so, so everybody sees this happening, and a lot of it is supply and demand. It's very simple. So the, so the manufacturers want these materials back. They really do. And you say, oh, sure, okay. But, you know, we, we did, we've done a few uh, pilot projects, uh, one with this Thomas Rao guy, uh, and we've got uh, Phillips. You've heard of Phillips, yeah? Yeah? We have Moza tiles. You know Moza? You've heard of them? Uh, Deso carpet, they all happen to be cradle cradle materials, ironically. But uh, um, uh, there's a few others, such that they all said, okay, we're going to do a pilot project and we're going to try this out. And they're really happy with it. But really, Philips, we had, and, and we, we got lighting for this, uh, for this uh, studio that was the most 
beautiful lighting. No way we could afford this normally. But if you look at the cost, because we're leasing it and we don't own it, I don't want to. If, if I'm a business owner, I don't want to own that light. I don't want to own this. I don't. I want to do business. You know, that's my first and foremost. I don't want to. You know, that's another thing. So there's there's lots of forces at play that actually make this work. So uh, so think about it. It's about getting the best possible product on the market to use to adore. Yeah, grandma's bike. Yeah. And after time, we demand a better product, something more efficient, advanced, and affordable. Why can't we lease these things? Yeah. So this is a company that uh, uh, is starting out. Uh, it's called Turn2, and it's uh, Thomas's company. I'll, I'm going to be doing some work with him, uh, developing it. But it's difficult because, you know, if you take this, this, and uh, you know that mouse pad, and all these things are made from companies that have bis different business plans. So th they're used to saying, hey, I make this, you buy it, I'm done. Okay, but now that's a different story. We're saying, no, I want it back, you get to lease it. Well, there's a lot of people who've been in the leasing game, but think of the building materials that uh, are soon to go into this. There's a building we actually, this is true. Uh, you know they have uh, uh, bricks that you can just, um, you don't have to put mortar on, you can just click them onto, they call click brick. Do you, have you seen those systems? They probably have them here. Uh, there's a Dutch company that uh, came up with this system and <coughs> we actually have leased a facade for a city hall in Holland. 50 year lease, which means the brick company at the, at the end of the 50 years can take the brick off and stick it in their pocket and go away. I know it sounds silly, but it's, it's about a concept and, and in 50 years, not even a city hall really knows if it's going to be there as a city hall. Maybe it's going to be a school, or maybe it's going to be housing. So maybe a whole facade, maybe one on the east side, they could take that brick off, stack it neatly over here, build an addition, put it back on, or an order more, or take it away. So um, it's real, and you can do this. And there's uh, uh, window systems in the U.S. and lots of different uh, uh, mechanisms. So this is to help give you a clue of some of your toolbox that you're going to have that's, that's a little different from your dad and your grandpa if they were in the uh, construction industry, in the building and design industry, we have a different toolbox now. All right, forget about architecture. Let's talk about clean tech. This is, this is fun. Um, we have a uh, green building is one of the, if you look at these uh, uh, Denmark clean, clean tech clusters, Denmark clean tech clusters, almost got that right. Uh, they have different categories. So we're in the green building business. This is the building that we're going to talk about later on. This is a cradle cradle building that, um, that uh, I've been working on for about five years. Uh, but I thought it would be nice to show you some statistics. So, yeah. yeah. There we are, Europe. So you can see the different, uh, uh, I'm, I dare do this, but there's North America, there's South America, there's Australia, Asia. Can you guys see this okay in the back? Yeah. And this is how much green building growth is going to be in the next five years. That's a lot of growth here. Okay? In America, it's even more. South America, Camilla, you'll have to tell me if this is right. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming. Uh, Australia, it's flatline. Asia, look at this. Wow. That's a plus of 40%. <coughs> so for sure. The guys who are in the, in the business of making money on technology and, and tracking this globally are saying, you guys have a future. This is the way the trends are going, okay? Let's look at some of the other things. Uh, smart grid. Well, Denmark, you know, you guys have some really smart guys over at, um, maybe here, but I, I do some work um, on a project called Cities for the Future, uh, DTU at Risso. You know where Risso is? Man, these guys have some, some <coughs> excuse me, some very smart people. Smart grid, of course, is the intelligent use of and direction of, uh, of green energy combined with the fading out of uh, conventional energy. And I think one of the main reasons why we're so good in Denmark is because we committed uh, so much to, uh, to wind energy. And I always thought, oh, okay, I get it. You know, when the winds calm down, what are you going to do? You're going to have to fire up the coal plants and everything. I said, no, no. It's when that wind's going too fast and those, 
uh, you know, those multi-million dollar um, uh, two megawatt uh, uh, towers can snap on, on their end. So they have to shut them down and then they have to power other energy up in order to compensate for this big commitment to wind power. So because of one, one driver is moving us towards wind, the other one's saying, hey, you know, we still have, to, you know, everybody, when, when the wind goes down, we still have to be able to operate all of our devices and, and our lifestyle. So enter smart grid um, know-how. That's the word, know-how. So where are we here? Europe is, okay, that's pretty good. And uh, the smart grid uh, is going higher and higher uh, in the different areas. But, you know, Asia, of course, still. And, and this is something that's very exportable, very exportable. It's very nice. So, uh, so we're doing quite well, smart grid. Next thing is offshore wind. <coughs> I love this. He's, he is transformer. Man, I bet that thing makes some noise. Um, so wind power, this is, of course, our pride and joy in Denmark. Look at that. That's in, all throughout Europe. America's, uh, they're growing because they're growing from zero, you know, so they're growing a lot in the other countries, etc. Uh, not so much here. Uh, so the numbers can be, um, without seeing a, a graphic representation, this says a 60% gain, but it's a 6% gain of zero, so it's nothing. But this is very substantial growth for wind. And uh, that's offshore wind, by the way. The, the um, inland wind is, is reducing. And then bioenergy. Right here in your own backyard, a little bit in the central up near uh, uh, Hostebro. Did I say that right? Yeah. I've been to this plant. This is really cool. This is just a mile high thermos container of, you guessed it, poop. This is, this is your poop here. This is your poop there. And then the rest of this is the little cows and the, the minks, those cute little minks and the et cetera, et cetera. But, um, this is Denmark's largest bioenergy plant. Yeah, you know, when you're in my business, you know, you sit around for a couple days at a time just talking about poop and pee because there's energy in it and we, it's a thing that you can use. And, but these guys up here, of course, we all know why we have to do something is because uh, the EU standards are such that they said, okay, at a certain date, you have to reduce 40% of these greenhouse gases because you're just killing us with uh, all this animal production and the animal waste, methane. And uh, so all these different um, groups, from the farmers to the power companies to uh, other uh, citizens groups, they all got together and they formed a corporation. They figured it out. It took them seven years. But this is truly an amazing plant. And they tax the guys. They come in with trucks full of the you-know-what. And they say, based on how far we had to travel to get it, you know, you have to pay us this. They process it, they make energy from it, and they give them back beautiful liquid fertilizer that doesn't uh, degrade phosphate and, and nitrogen from the soil. We have a problem with, <coughs> sorry, I got a problem with having the flu last week. We have a problem with uh, the depleted soil and, uh, and phosphorus. So this, is, this thing here is doing so many things in the right direction. And it's, uh, the, the, the rules for biofuels, of course, is that you, you're not supposed to we're not supposed to take away food crops to make energy out of it, but we can use animal waste, which is not as efficient, and we can also use crops that are not taking away from food, but sometimes they have these, these catch crops that are crops between crops that enrich the food, but they are actually very good to get biofuel from. So all of this is kind of goes into the mix of what we think about for clean technology. And, of course, we're doing quite well here. I think we're led by Germany, but Denmark and Sweden are, are quite good. And uh, America is, has a lot of potential. And even though they're already doing an enormous amount, they only show a 5% jump. But you just look at the, the, the pillars here. You can see what's going on. And, uh, and then solid waste management. Now, this is, this is the big controversial thing because a lot of people come to Denmark and they say, well, first of all, we're not contributing hardly anything to the landfills anymore. Well, that's, that's, most people say that's a good thing, huh? No, because what we're doing is we're burning it, okay? And burning it is, uh, is, is it's amazing because on one respect, you're, 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 you're preserving land. Maybe you're not polluting land, but all the things that are, uh, you know, inside of this, you know, that the materials,
inside of your little iPhones, there's certain parts in here that in seven years, it'll be done. There's no more of that on the planet. I know, oh, boo-hoo, you know, we'll just go over to Nokia or something. But I really like these guys. And uh, no, but the, 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 point, the point is, is that um, uh, there are guys in, uh, in different parts of the world, in South America, who have, uh, if you just draw a little datum line through here, and you say, well, that line below that was uh, from 1960 to 1970. They say, I want to lease that, and I'm going to come and get that someday in the future. There are people that are doing this right now. Because up to here, they, you know, they didn't use as much copper, or but down here, we just was throwing this stuff away because it's so abundant. This is, our, this is our natural resources now, in the landfill. So this is an interesting, uh, interesting discussion. And that's why in, uh, in Copenhagen, they decided to uh, stop. They were going to build another incinerator there. And I, I have very good friends at Dong Energy who are, you know, whenever I open up my mouth, they're saying, oh, don't say that, David. You know, but they're, they also understand, too, that it's green energy in a certain way, but it's, it's so precious, we can't just burn things up anymore. So, uh, and the rest of the world is kind of catching on to this well. But I think that we really, uh, we're, we're understanding it well in Northern Europe. And uh, so these are just some of the numbers. After, these charts are kind of boring after a while. But this one's not boring. This is uh, in the middle, of course. This is the global picture for all the center of gravity for clean tech growth is moving east and west. This is us right here, huh? But look at this, all these different, uh, you know, uh, places that are uh, going to be uh, increasing in their uh, clean technologies in a big, very big measurable way. So you're going to see everybody's going to be talking about exporting our know-how. And because I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you are going to be so expensive for our local market. You know, and you're going to hear this in your lifetime, maybe not the first year, but certainly the second year. Um, and that's why um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of you will probably find jobs overseas working for Danish companies. Um, I mean, it'll change. It'll come and go. But uh, uh, it, is, it is a fact that we are too expensive to service our own needs here. Okay? So it's all about labor. and It's about uh, uh, the, the days after this wonderful thing we call the financial crisis. Uh, but it is a, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. And everything's kind of shifting at one time. There's plenty to do, but uh, it's, it's important to be aware of these numbers because these numbers, no way that we're going to change these numbers. You know? This is the forces of the world talking. So all we can do is we can jump on the, onto the flow of it, you know, like a, like a wooly master or something. You know? um, so time to take the big jump. You know? did, anybody, did you see this crazy guy? Yeah? He's a cradle cradle guy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So, anyways, that's, uh, that's the presentation for now. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, what's our time like? Oh, that's 42 minutes. Was that right? Yeah, uh, so I'd like to kind of prompt a few questions from you guys. I talked about a lot of things. I'm prompting some questions, which means that I'd like for you to ask a few questions. And I won't leave until you do. You were about to say something? No? OK. Um, OK. So what uh, you are in a three or four year course right here for constructing? First. Four? First. First. But how many years do you, is the program? Three and a half years. OK. So first year guys are most of you guys first? Second? Third? You, you got to show me some hands. What's this, second year? Is this second year? Third? Mostly third. Okay. 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 The guys who have been around, the, the seasoned veterans here, who have designed a few projects, maybe someone from the back row. You guys look like the, the, uh, the voice of experience here. Um, have you had any, uh, any projects that you've, um, that you've uh, talked about uh, buildings that can be uh, uh, disassembled or temporary buildings? Have you s come across any of that in your curriculum studies yet? Mm -mm. No? 
Okay. Uh, what about um, no? Okay. What about uh, what about the, the science of uh, of healthy materials? Is that studied here at all? As far as what's a like, you know, what what's the type of material that you don't really want in a building anymore? Something that has uh, oil paint, say, yeah, um, or uh, PVC, you know, that, asbestos, yeah, non-toxic materials. Okay. And uh, what about energy producing buildings? Are you guys uh, working uh, towards uh, technologies, uh, towards uh, developing energy that's coming from your building? Yeah? For example? PV panels. PV panels? Okay. Geothermal energy. Geothermal. Okay. Is it shallow geothermal or? And uh, and and who who's done any work on with uh, PV panels on on a building? Any, you you have yeah, a few, okay. And have you found uh, was it was it recent work or is it uh, work from a year or two ago or? Because new things are happening with the PV market. Have you been reading about it? You know the the amount of PVs that are coming in that are being dumped in from China, which uh, you know all the guys who are here who own PVs. Uh, companies in Germany, especially, I have a friend who has who inv uh, invested heavily, and they can't compete, and they're going to go out of business. But guess what? We have all these cheap chips now. You know, it's it's just a wonderful thing. So uh, there's a it's a time that we can start to apply it, and it used to be just in a couple of years ago is cost prohibitive. In fact, I'll show you on that project um, that uh, green uh, uh, project in, in at Schiphol Airport in in Holland three years ago. They were saying, we can't put those uh, BIPV panels on the roof. We just can't do it. And they did. And now it's, huh, they did pay a lot of money back, even just two years ago. Uh, what else? What else is, uh, have you guys done that's related to the topic today? Some help from the faculty, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Well, I only heard of uh, some wooden panels from last year that are instead of, uh, it's like a cross laminated timber, but instead of adhesives and glues, they use. Like dowels to connect the boards together, and they form like panels that can be used to erect buildings. But then, after some years, the dowels can be removed back in the factory, and the boards can be uh, used again to create new panels. Yeah, which is kind of a cradle to cradle. Well, it's spot on. I mean, it doesn't get more cradle to cradle than that. Plus, the fact that it's a biological nutri nutrient. If they haven't um, uh, treated the wood. But uh, can, you, can anybody imagine another material that could be, this is a great example, thanks, that's, uh, that could be similar to that, uh, that type of product that you could put it together. These are like with uh, dovetail joints and pegs and friction. Um, other type of technologies that could be uh, used in the future. Well, it's just an open question. Um, but uh, have you heard of um, uh, the term called biomimicry? Yeah? yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. That's where they're taking and observing nature and seeing how we can learn from nature and make new things. Like the guys, uh, you know, who uh, came up with Velcro, you know, <laughs> that stuff. You know, they, the, the little gecko frogs that can climb walls. Well, they, they figured th things out from, from s little small animals and I, I I think it's wonderful. We're, uh, we're engaging on some, uh, some work with, um, with um, Biomimicry Institute in the U.S. It might be interesting for you guys to uh, be in contact with, uh, with the people from Biomimicry because you can get some great ideas, things that happen in nature that happen. Or if you have a, maybe your brother or sister or, or biologist or ecologist. But we really do have to learn from nature because nature does a lot better job than we do. Those, um, those panels, you said they're from Austria or New Zealand or something? Austria. Yeah. I think they have some here in, uh, in Norway uh, that yeah, is solid. We have, we have that company called Holtz. Holtz. 100. Holtz 100, yeah. 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 And, and um, basically, you could say the students, they, they, they get to focus on such topics but for a short amount of time. Yeah. Like, for example, if you're studying for a report or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at least the first year is kind of learning these basics of construction. Yeah. And yeah. Then trying to implement more uh, you know, into when can we fit it in without losing too much of you know these kind of basics of construction. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot to learn when you're at your stage because you just look in front of you, all these things that uh, everybody knows, and you say, you know, I have to figure this out. But in a short amount of time, someone's going to be paying you to figure that out because you're going to have what they call a job, and uh, hopefully. And, uh, and there are going to be a lot of guys sitting around the table, you know, with you and uh, saying, you know, come on, you know, we've got a deadline here. And, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel and let's do it the old way that we've been doing it, which, of course, you'll have to do because they're your boss, okay? But uh, there's a new, there are going to be new ways to look at this. And uh, I think the most, the most valuable people in our, in our business are the, are the ones that are going to really turn it upside down and question these things. Why are we doing this? You know, and uh, uh, sometimes it's, um, sometimes we're doing it strictly from a, 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 a uh, economic standpoint, which, uh, of course, this, this is a big part of uh, why we do things. <coughs> but sometimes we're doing it because the governance is wrong. You know, the, the way that the, the government, which had the right intentions, has set up uh, some rules for a certain uh, industry to thrive when there's another industry that is going to be better for their society. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different reasons why sometimes we get caught and stuck in old habits. But, um, but you have plenty of time to, uh, to see this for yourself. Um, um, but the, uh, what's, what is remarkable is when you see your unique position in the, um, in the production chain, is that you're going to have people that have these wonderful ideas, and, uh, and, and they're going to want to come back at the end of a product and see this wonderful idea in all of its full three-dimensional, four-dimensional glory, for done for a very limited you know, amount of money, and you're going to be the one responsible to making sure that that thing comes together and has these beautiful joints, and it's going to be there forever, and it's going to be perfect. And, um, and, and that's great, but um, uh, when you're talking about a cradle-to-cradle type of thinking, uh, you know, back when I was a boy, when I was in your situation, uh, you know, we were supposed to build things that were permanent so that they're so beautiful, so they're, they're, it, you couldn't extract them from their location or custom fit. It's like couture, you know, something for the queen's, you know, dress for her wedding. Absolutely one of a kind. That's, what, that's how they used to train us, you know. But now, I, I, what's the term? Probably the, the best term I could say is long life but loose fit. So that, so that this thing can have a multiple of different uses. So that means sometimes you overscale things a little bit just so that you can, uh, well, a good example, we had a, a city hall building in, uh, uh, in central Holland. And, uh, and they, this is a city that was caught between two cities. You know, it's like they knew they had to do this uh, city hall, but they knew that there was a threat that maybe the other two cities would grow so fast that they would be kind of gobbled up between the two. So they knew that this, Mother being, necessity being the mother invention, they knew that this town hall had to be flexible. So just by adding like one extra stairwell per pod, so it's three extra stairwells, we could easily convert this to a multiple uh, different uses, including housing. So even, even though we haven't had to do that yet, they could, they, it's foreseeable in the next uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years that it'd have a different use. So these are the type of things. <coughs> If you can make uh, things that can be bolted together and uh, taken apart, I think that's, that's a very good start. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Have you had any experience in renovation of old buildings or things using cradle to cradle principles? Yeah. Have you had any inspirations? Uh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, that was one of the uh, topics we were going to have as, a <coughs> as another, as another uh, workshop was cradle-to-cradle renovation protocol. Uh, um, renovation is really a big part of what our future is going to be as well. You know, you've probably heard it yourself uh, that, you know, it's what we're doing with our existing buildings that's much more critical than all the new buildings that everybody wants to do. They're fun and sexy and charming and that's what's going to get you in the design manuals, but 
really, what can you do with this ugly old 1970s building over here? Well, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to a blank wall. And, uh, and, and bring that into a new use without having to take it down and, and completely uh, strip it out to, to nothing, and which you might as well tear it down all the way. So this is a big deal. And, and, and the creative minds that are busy on this. And I, we, um, we took this to McDonough's office. And uh, for about three or four months, they had a, they had a project as a, as a high rise in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, which is actually where my parents live. Ugliest building is a bank building that had this, um, uh, what do you call that, uh, like copper coated reflective glass. So it really looked old, you know. And it was, it was a miserable failure. They had condensation and all this stuff. But it was relatively, it wasn't that old of a building. It was only made in the 70s or 80s. And so uh, the, the government wanted, they put money into to see what we could do to renovate this. And they came to McDonough to say if, see if there's a way to do this with cradle cradle thinking. And of course, they <coughs> the methodologies that they have there at McDonough is amazing. <coughs> Pardon me. And so I, I was new to McDonough's office at the time, and I, I went over there and we started talking about it. And uh, in, in, in a renovation project, first of all, you know, if you have, um, uh, let's just say you're going to do 10 things to a building, okay? You're going to let, you're going to maybe change this, the stair core in the bathrooms. You're going to, uh, uh, the windows on the east side are shot. We're going to replace those. Ceilings over here. We're going to put a, a, a standalone addition onto this side of the building. You know, the, the list goes on and on. So you add up those 10 things, right? And then... That l there's a little thing they call the bottom right-hand corner of your budget sheet. That's, that's like the total cost, right? So as you go through the, the, the um, initial uh, conceptual design, you, you fix these 10 different interventions into cost, you know, meters per Danish crowns. And, and that's to equal this. And so anytime one of those moves up, one of these moves down, you know? Real, real advanced thinking here, but it's true. This is the only thing that, that, that matters to a building owner. He says, I'm going to operate on this building, but we have a fixed budget here. You guys figure it out. So this is, this is a universal thing. Okay, great. So we figure out how to do that, and we, ha we, fi we figure out how to do those things cradle to cradle by using cradle to cradle materials. Okay, great. Still kind of boring because... What are, you, what are you really doing? Is this the, we, we'd call this just uh, best practices. You know, you're, doing, you're doing good things, but you're not creating... Uh, it, it's very difficult to take an old building that is made of toxic materials and say that we're going to do something with those toxic materials in the technosphere and we're going to recycle those with this turn two process. No, you know, we've got, we've got something that we don't know what to do with. Yeah? So... Um, uh, so anyways, the, uh, uh, it, it took a lot of uh, trial and error, but I, I have a whole another presentation on that. And uh, there are things you can do. Uh, I'll give you one example. <coughs> we had a, uh, you know what the, a product called Core 10 is? Have you heard of it? It's, it's copper. You know, and they used to make uh, panels, exterior panels on buildings, again, in the 70s. Yeah. So there's a place called Almira, which is an, a man-made island uh, north of Amsterdam. Okay, they made it in the 60s or 70s, something like that, and so they started building there, and um, and they, they had this um, this kind of community building that was made of core 10, and uh, and then they had all this social housing all around it, and there's a there's a community, and and it's kind of weird when you start a community that last year was underwater, you know, and and then this year. You know, suddenly people, you know, these are like real pioneers, you know, this, so, the, so everything that they've done in this place has a, has a social value to it, even a really ugly old building. They said, we should just scrape this thing off and build a beautiful state-of-the-art new community center for our social housing that circles around it. Well, the, the, the guys who own, like the, the guys who own the uh, social housing, like the KAB and the AAB guys that, uh, you know, your social housing, they said, <laughs> 